There are effective ways to use art in your home, and then there are ridiculously effective ways to use art in your home. We're going to explore the latter. Hi, I'm Marina Coates. Welcome to Cinematically Inspired Design, where we take the design secrets from the cinema and bring them into your own homes. In this episode, we'll be examining how the cinema uses artwork in a home to create a mood and tell a story of the people who live there. We'll look at everything from paintings to rugs, from furniture to sculptures, and everything in between. And of course, we'll learn several design techniques from the cinema along the way. Let's get started. Today we're going to focus on two of the ways the cinema chooses art for a movie home. Number one, to create a mood. And number two, to tell a story about the people who live there. When the cinema wants to get art for a movie home, they have access to a vast amount of pieces. But luckily with the advent of the internet, so do we. Did you know that many famous works of art are part of the public domain? That means you're able to download the image, print it, frame it, and use it in your own home. And there are sites that allow you to put prints on canvas or gicle, as well as choose the size you want, and the frame and the matting. I'll add links below for all of this. You can be like a set designer for your own home. Need a Van Gogh for your master bathroom that's two feet by three feet? No problem. You get to customize it for what you need for your space. Now, back to how to choose art for your home. In good set design, the cinema uses artwork, among other things, to create a mood and tell a story of the people who live there. You can do the same thing in your home. Create the mood you want there and tell your story. In film, sometimes the art can even fill in the blanks for narratives about the character that go unspoken. At times, this can be a form of metaphor. Recently, a viewer watched my Cinematically Inspired Design introduction episode, where I lay out the eight pillars of design that we will be covering over the course of this series, and she noticed that one of the pillars was marked metaphor. She wanted to understand better what that means as it relates to design. And I thought you might too. To briefly sum it up, it's when there are elements in the set design that are symbolic of something else or represent something deeper than what you see at face value. This adds to creating a mood and telling more of the story of the people that live there. Let's look at an example from the cinema that illustrates this principle. Alfred Hitchcock was known for using metaphor in his films. In his movie, The Birds, when we first meet Suzanne Plachette's character, Annie, we don't know much about her yet at all. But we see on her walls paintings of San Francisco and pieces you might see in a modern art museum at that time. And yet here's this school teacher living in a modest home in a field next to the school in the small town of Bodega Bay. It makes you wonder why those works of art would be inside of a home like that. What it's doing is helping to fill in more of Annie's background story for the viewer. Later we learn bits and pieces about her life and why she's there, and then it all begins to make sense. She loved San Francisco. That's where she met the love of her life, Mitch. They spent a great deal of time together there in the big city. But that was over now, but she still was choosing to live in Bodega Bay to be near him. The art on her walls gives a hint at this and suggests that a part of her heart is still in the big city. The artwork was a metaphor. It represented something and it was helping to silently tell us more of her story. We can do the same thing in our homes. We can choose some pieces that fill in our story without saying a word. And often that can be done by using a work that represents a part of us or a part of our life, a part of our story. Here's another example of metaphor, or something that symbolizes something else. Notice the different pieces of artwork chosen for the ranch house in the parent trap. We see big, chunky, rustic frames for most of the paintings. We see lots of large-scale furniture, even extra-wide hallways. We see horse sculptures, some with a primitive feel to them. These qualities line up with the characteristics of the owner of the home, Mitch, played by Brian Keith 
a bachelor who is big and tall and broad-shouldered. He's also a hard-working rancher who prefers old Jeeps and blue jeans. And yet, let's look at that artwork again. What type of artwork do those big, chunky, rustic frames hold? We see things in them full of color and beauty, culturally refined. And all of this describes Maggie, his ex-wife who re-enters the picture, played by the lovely Maureen O'Hara, who is full of life, color, and beauty. She dresses in the latest fashions. She's from Boston and lives a more culturally refined lifestyle. The artwork in the home is giving us a pretty big hint from the moment we enter that these two could work well together. Interesting little side note. I noticed that one of the paintings in the home switches this composition around. The painting inside is of horses, but the frame surrounding it is decidedly not rustic, but instead Baroque, a rather ornate and feminine style. Genius. I bet the set designers had fun with this movie home. And then there are movies that use the works of art in a home to tell the stories of the characters in a more literal sense, such as in A Star is Born, where both of the main characters, Esther and Norman, are actors. And we see on the wall above their fireplace a colorful painting of theater masks. And yet, even then, there is a deeper meaning. Theater masks represent both comedy and tragedy, both of which are present in their lives in this film. In Rear Window, the art in Jeff's apartment is more literal, but it still tells us about the man. He's a photographer whose camera captures a lot of adventures. His bookshelves are lined with his work. But even this comes into play later in a deeper sense, when we realize that one of his qualms about marrying his girlfriend Lisa is that he doesn't initially think that she's the adventurous type, merely a high society fashion girl. He discovers later that he's wrong when she goes on a daring mission for him. But one of the closing scenes in the movie shows her reading a book about adventure and then changing it out for a fashion magazine. Clearly, she's both. I wonder if they were to get married, would their home reflect both of these sides like we saw in the Parent Trap House? Hmm. In the movie Giant, Rock Hudson's character, Bick, is a Texas rancher with a large, sprawling ranch. His home is seemingly in the middle of nowhere. The walls inside tell of his life in a more literal way. There are pictures of cattle in his office behind his desk and a huge Texas size one hanging over the sofa. After he marries Leslie, a very feminine, refined woman from the East Coast, things slowly change, including Bick. Until by the end of the movie, the home has a completely different feeling right down to the furnishings and artwork. In Breakfast at Tiffany's, Holly Golightly's apartment, as well as her name, suggests someone who is unconventional, a free spirit, full of life. The furnishings convey this through bright colors, a sofa made out of a bathtub, and whimsical decor such as the weather vane by the front door. If you saw this image of the apartment and didn't know anything about the story, you would still understand quite a bit about the person who lives here. It all helps tell her story. In Pillow Talk, in the office of Jonathan Forbes, played by Tony Randall, we see that he has framed out his degrees as if they were works of art using huge frames and matting to give them more of a presence in the room. This is in line with how his character would think. Earlier, he describes New York City with excitement as being full of jostling, struggling people fighting for their lives. He's fought for his place on the career ladder, and here is his proof, his degrees, their trophies, so these are some of the things that mean a lot to him. You could take things that mean something to you, frame them and hang them in a grouping. We often see groupings of family photos, but there are many other things that can tell your story. Perhaps your grandmother's recipes hung on a wall in your kitchen. Or if you love attending plays, you could have a framed grouping of programs from the theater. Other ideas could be album covers, flowers from your garden, whatever comes to your mind. What could you hang on the wall that would represent things that mean something to you and tell a part of your story, who you are? Have fun with it. In To Sir With Love, Sidney Poitier plays a teacher who is given an unruly group of students and tries to teach them a more principled way of life. 
Part of his effort in doing this involves taking them to museums. Before leaving, he tells them, You'll discover that your hairstyles are 200 years old and your dress is right out of 1920. Basically saying, you'll find yourself in the art there. As they tour the museums, we get shots of the students finding artwork that they see themselves in. When you fall in love with a work of art of any type, there's always some reason behind it. Otherwise, everybody would like all the same things. It's resonating with some part of you. If you examine it a little further, you may discover why. This may help you in your selection of some of the future art pieces for your home or work. If they were making a movie about your life, what might the set designers put in your home to tell people about you? How might they fill in unspoken gaps, literal or otherwise? Now on to using art to create a mood. Set designers are masters at this. After all, the cinema only has about two hours to tell us everything we need to know about the characters and to create a mood or set the tone for the film. They've learned design techniques to condense down the information most effectively, so we don't have to spend weeks getting to know the characters. Why wouldn't we want to borrow from their expertise for our own homes? It's a no-brainer. Let's look at some examples where the art chosen for a film helped create the mood or set the tone of the film. Now admittedly, there will be overlap between creating a mood and telling a story. In the age of Adeline, we meet a woman who has lived in many decades without ever aging. So she has both an old soul and a modern one. I love that the set designers did such a good job of marrying the different eras in the house she comes to feel very at home in. A place that houses both a past love of hers and a current one. It sets a mood for the place that has a fluid time element. In other words, you can't quite put your finger on which decade the furnishings and decor are from because they transcend being of any one particular decade, like Adeline herself. The mood in John's apartment from Vertigo is neat, tidy, orderly, and well-kept. If we saw this apartment, we would know something of his character before we even meet him. And true to form, at this point in the film, he is a soft-spoken, disciplined man with measured responses. His friend Midge's apartment has a completely different atmosphere. It's a bit untidy and chaotic, yet has a cheerful tone, much like Midge herself, who's upbeat, but is less in control than her counterpart, sometimes impulsively saying whatever comes to her mind and then regretting it. In the film Imitation of Life, as the name suggests, we watch a couple of the main characters living lives where they are pretending to be something they aren't play acting, rather than being honest with who they are. I find it interesting then that the set designers chose paintings of clowns in one of the main rooms with a backdrop of hot pink on the walls. It sets the mood of a world that isn't quite real, more fanciful. Let's go back to Pillow Talk for a minute, this time to look at how they used art to create a mood. Rock Hudson plays Brad Allen, a Broadway songwriter professionally, and a bit of a playboy in his personal life. He has a fairly small apartment divided into two main parts. One side is for business. He has his piano there for work where he writes his music and he has a small library. So on this side of the apartment, the art has a formal layout, all in a row, all the same size. The other side of the apartment is used for play. There's a button he pushes near the sofa to bring down the lights and turn on soft music while he romances one young woman after another. The art on this side is laid out markedly different. It's a jumbled menagerie of art. With that arrangement and the deep red curved wall behind it, it creates a completely different mood than the calm, formal display above the library. When I did a virtual redesign of the Brady Bunch home, I was trying to picture what that family might be living like today. In order to subtly create a mood that was reminiscent of the Brady home we all know and love, I made sure to include a little orange in every room. If you'll remember, the Brady Bunch house had some pretty heavy doses of orange. So with that in mind, here's the remodel I created of Mike's Den. Notice how the artwork played a key role in bringing in the mood I wanted to capture both in the use of orange, but also the choice to have both pieces be centered around architecture since Mike Brady was an architect. 
Before we move on, let's look at some examples of framed art and examine different ways to hang it and frame it and how to know if you have the correct size for your space. We'll start with some examples of framing found in the cinema. This is from Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. They use the same frames and matting, but the sizes and the art inside vary. This allows you to take whatever art you already have, even if the styles and sizes differ, and give them a cohesive look within the room. Here's another example of that same concept in Designing Woman. The art varies a great deal here in color, genre, and size, and yet keeping the frames and matting so similar keeps them from feeling disconnected. In the film Imitation of Life, there's a twist on this theme. Here the frames vary, but the art inside is very similar. Again, this allows for continuity, so it works. Now let's look at framing in general. There are as many framing and matting styles as there are paintings. Here are some interesting examples found in some of your favorite movie homes. And now let's look at some different ways to hang works of art. There's the formal way mentioned before, all in a row. Here we see one line of framed prints. And here we see rows and columns, all lined up neatly. And then there are clusters of art arranged freestyle. This menagerie of art is great for a less formal feeling. And of course works well when you have a large assortment of mismatched works that you want to include on a wall. This example from Dial M for Murder is interesting. It has one large piece of abstract art in the middle, surrounded by photographs. I hope these cinematic examples of different ways to hang art gave you some ideas for your own home. One last thing, and this is more universal rather than subjective, the size of the artwork within the space you have. One big no-no is to hang a too small painting in a large wall space. The art gets lost in the wall space and loses its significance. We barely take note. But if you take that same painting and hang it in a smaller wall space, voila, you notice it again. It's that simple. Now we're going to explore other forms of art found in the cinema that aren't frame prints you hang on the wall. We'll start with furnishings. This list is comprised of furniture, rugs, decor, flowers, lamps, mirrors, china, and more traditional forms of art such as sculptures. Here are some examples from the cinema where some pieces of furniture have risen to the level of an art piece in the room. And in these examples, rugs play an integral part in the design scheme. After all, rugs are works of art on your floor and sometimes on your wall. Flowers by nature are art. They're full of life and color and organic shapes. When their scale is large enough to make their presence felt, it becomes a living form of art adding vitality to a room. Here are some lamps in movie homes that added to the artistic scheme of the room. Not all mirrors are created equal and these are definitely out of the norm and become another form of hanging art. And we'll conclude this portion of the episode with the use of sculptures in film. Notice in particular the scale of the objects and also the placement of these pieces within the setting. It may give you some ideas of where you could place this type of art in your own home. Notice how often they're placed directly below paintings. This gives more of an impression that a collector of art lives there, someone who appreciates fine art. When you go on trips, do you love to visit art museums? Do you love to collect pieces from your travels? This look may resonate with you and tell a little of your story. Many architectural elements are art forms in themselves. To illustrate, look at these examples where architectural features became a visual feast. By the way, I have an episode of Cinematically Inspired Design that is dedicated solely to architectural elements. It's episode five, shown here. Now before we close, here are just a couple things that didn't fit neatly into any of the categories above. Here are some examples where they took either a recessed area or a niche and added color or art inside. In the movie Marnie, we see a bookcase with the back wall painted a deep emerald green. 
Notice it matches the sofa in this instance. It also helps make the objects on the shelves stand out more. In the 1954 version of A Star is Born, they painted a mural on the back wall of a niche rather than just hanging framed art there. And it has a primitive look to it, almost like hieroglyphics. And I love how that contrasts with the modern look of the rest of the home. In the 1956 adaptation of High Society, there's a hidden bar in the library wall that opens up when a book is moved. Notice the back of the bar has a recessed area trimmed out with a gold picture frame. The back wall of it behind the glasses is colored a beautiful cherry red. Those are the kind of simple details that make a room memorable. I hope you enjoyed today's exploration of how the cinema uses art to create a mood and tell a story of the people who live there. But I especially hope it got your mind going, thinking about your own home and what you might do to create the mood you want there and tell the story of your family. If you don't want to miss any episodes, make sure you subscribe. But as for today, that's a wrap. See you next time on Cinematically Inspired Design.